Everybody, Honorable Supreme Court Justice, thank you very much for being here. Tribal Nation leaders, constitutional officers, Major Dunbar and members of the Wisconsin National Guard, as well as active and reserve members of our armed forces, cabinet members, Senate President Roth, Majority Leader Fitzgerald, Minority Leader Schilling, Speaker Voss, and Minority Leader Hintz, legislators, distinguished guests, as, and most importantly, the people of Wisconsin, welcome and thank you for being here this evening. Appreciate that. My favorite pickleball player, Kathy, is also right up there in the gallery tonight. Thank you, Kathy, always for your love and support. Before we get started, I also want to mention someone who's with us in the gallery tonight. All of you know I talk a lot about connecting the dots. Well, Karen is an operator for the Milwaukee County Transit System. She literally makes connections every day. While on her route one day, Karen noticed a boy alone, freezing cold. She pulled over to make sure he was okay, but noticed the boy wasn't wearing any socks or shoes. So Karen brought the boy onto her bus and kept him safe and warm while she called for help. Folks like Karen embody our Wisconsin values like kindness, compassion, empathy, and respect. Karen, thank you for joining us tonight and for your exceptional work. After introducing you to Karen, it's, I'm humbled to introduce myself, but I'm Tony Evers, and I'm incredibly proud to be here as the 46th Governor of Wisconsin, announcing my first biennial budget for our state. You know, I guess you might say I've spent some time in education, give or take, for a handful of years. And, and one of the most important lessons I took away from my time in the classroom is that you learn more from listening than you ever do from talking. So after Mandela and I were elected, we decided we wanted to do a listening session tour across Wisconsin. We wanted to hear directly from the people of our state about what they wanted to see in the budget I'm announcing here tonight. But we don't want to show up, we didn't want to show up months later, budget in hand and say, so what do you think? We said we'd always put people first. That's why we wanted everyone to be part of finding those solutions together. So what we did was we turned the standard listening session formula on its head. And by golly, the darndest thing happened. People showed up from different backgrounds and different communities. They sat, they talked to each other, and they listened to each other's perspectives. And they had a dialogue about the problems our state is facing and the best way to fix them. And they range from Republicans to Democrats to the democratically disenfranchised to the politically apathetic. And sometimes they even disagreed, but they did so amicably. Never with elevated voices, never out of spitefulness, and never with disrespect. I know in today's day and age, what I'm describing might sound like a unicorn phenomenon of sorts, but the good news is we managed to capture proof of it actually happening. And I'd like to share that with you tonight. So we have a video. Roll it, Lester. People like to be listened to. The people that uh, are paying the taxes and the people that are voting, they like to be listened to. They want to tell folks uh, how they want government to run. So it was important for us to get the uh, opinion of people uh, before the budget process even started. 
These weren't invite only events, they were open to the public. Uh, so we got a broad range of ideas, you know, things that you know, people have thought were important for a long time that have been neglected for the last eight years. I wanted to make sure that the actual policies and budget items we develop are directly related to people in Wisconsin. So we thought, what better way than to go out and ask them. Uh, specifically coming here tonight to talk about criminal justice reform, healthcare concerns. Someone needs to advocate more strongly for our seniors. I'm very passionate about the work I do, which is in education. I've been very concerned with the rural uh, economics in the state of Wisconsin. I wanted the governor to know how important public transit is to people across the state. For student uh, debt and student loan reform is another one. An interest in helping the environment, so that's what I'm here for. Uh, the issue regarding with uh, undocumented or illegal people, I don't get into the narrative. I just think it's a situation that needs to be fixed. There's no way uh, any of your elected officials are going to have expertise in every area they're required to vote upon. Uh, so they need to rely on actual experts in the field to help provide them the information so they can make educated uh, decisions. This event allowed for what I believe in to actually start to happen, which is those that are closest to the problem um, are those that are furthest from the resources but can be empowered to make the most change. Uh, I think it's a very powerful and wonderful experience to have people participate regardless of political persuasion. I just see the hope rising in our state. We feel that uh, someone cares. People in power need to hear from the average person. They need to hear the issues, what people are concerned about. The needs of North Central Wisconsin are unique to North Central Wisconsin and they need to be heard. They need to be part of uh, the way that the state gets governed. I think each individual plays a role in making our state a better place, so I think it's, it's, it's about civic engagement. Just relationships are going to always be at the foundation of how we actually make ourselves better. Like having a connection with people that we may not have is going to make us care about issues that we might not have known about. All these elected officials are walking around the room and listening to the comments of others and really taking it in. I think with being heard, there is going to come an expectation from the community that something will be done with the information that's collected tonight and throughout the state. People care enough to actually come out and do this and spend an evening not just talking at somebody, but interacting with other people. The people of Wisconsin care about the government and want their government to work well. But interacting with other people, the people of Wisconsin care about the government and want their government to work well. Thank you. Now, I show the I showed this to you tonight for a few reasons. The first, although I said it tongue-in-cheek, is to show you that people really can get along. The Wisconsinites can come to a room armed with different ideas to listen to each other and compromise on solutions. Then we should be able to do that right here in this building. Second, I want everybody to understand how we arrived here. At the end of the day, our budget is about putting people first. It's about creating a Wisconsin that works for everyone, Wisconsin for us. Believe it or not, this is not the Tony Evers budget. It's not the Democratic budget, the Speaker's budget, or the Republican budget. This is the people's budget. And it's... And it's one that we crafted together. We heard from people like Mary Ann, who lives in Coleman, and Senator Tiffany and Representative Mursaw's district, and Nancy, who lives in Amherst, and Senator Teston and Representative Shanklin's district. 
Both Marianne and Nancy came to our listening session and talked to us about water quality and water pollution issues across this great state. Because of people like Marianne and Nancy, we're announcing that we're making, a safe, we're making safe drinking water a top priority in Wisconsin. We are authorizing nearly $70 million in bonding to address water quality from replacing lead service lines to addressing water contamination all across the state. <laughs> now, I know Rep uh, Representative Shanklin has been working closely with us on this issue, too. Thank you, Representative Shanklin, and to Mary Ann and Nancy, who are here with us in the gallery tonight for advocating for this very important issue. Folks, Mary Ann. We also heard from people like Tony, who lives in Senator Petrowski and Representative Snyder's district in Wausau. Tony, Tony not only has a great first name, <laughs> but, but he also came to one of our listening sessions and talked about why we need driver's cards for immigrants and persons who are undocumented, especially in communities where there's limited access to public transportation. Because of people like Tony, we're announcing tonight that undocumented folks will be eligible to receive driver license and ID cards. This makes our roads and our communities safer and helps strengthen our economy and Wisconsin fa families. I know Representative Samaripa has worked on this issue, and Tony is here with us tonight in the gallery. Thank both of you for your work on this issue. And finally, I share that tonight so that everybody understands what's at stake in choosing to play politics with this budget. We have to be better, we have to be a better version of democracy than we have in the past. At times, we've succumbed to the trivial pursuit of political outposturing. At times, we let partisanship cloud the opportunity for compromise. And at times, we let power be the enemy of the good. So tonight, I want to be clear this can't be one of those times. We cannot afford to play politics with this budget. Folks, the stakes are really, really high. As I told you in my inaugural address, I believe in leading by example. That's why we're going to begin tonight on the things about which we can all agree. I've said all along that reforming our criminal justice system is an area where I know Republicans and Democrats can work together. So earlier this week, I announced we're going to return kids who are 17 to the juvenile justice system. And I'm investing more than $200 million in additional funds so that we can get kids out of Lincoln Hills and get them closer to home as soon as we safely and responsibly can. I know there's been bipartisan work on this issue in the past. I want to thank you for your work on this issue, and I look forward to working together with you in the days ahead. Now, 
Juvenile justice is only one part of a larger picture. We have to connect the dots in criminal justice by tackling this issue holistically. Starting the moment someone encounters the justice system to the moment they rejoin our communities, we have to look at everything from alternatives to incarceration, to equity and representation, to substance <coughs> abuse prevention, to reentry programming. The criminal justice system starts in our communities. So we're announcing tonight that we're allocating $2 million on a grant program for community policing through the Department of Justice in 10 cities with the highest violent crime rates in Wisconsin. But at, but at the same time, we also need to come to terms with the fact that nonviolent drug arrests are contributing to overcrowding and economic inequity, instability, and insecurity in our state. That's why I announced a few weeks ago that our budget will decriminalize marijuana possession for 25 grams or less. And we also have to ensure that, that once someone encounters our criminal justice system, that they're receiving adequate, fair, and vigorous representation. So we're increasing the private bar reimbursement rate to $70 an hour, and we're providing more than 25 additional assistant district attorneys across our state. Under our plan, ADA positions will be the highest they've been since 2011. That will allow us to make sure that the justice system is efficient and works for everyone. I know that Representative Bourne recently advocated for similar initiatives and that there's been a bipartisan support for this issue in the past. I'm hopeful that these will receive bipartisan support in our budget. Additionally, we need to make sure that while folks are incarcerated, they have the tools to be successful when they re-enter our communities. So we're expanding the opening of avenues to re-entry success program to all 72 counties, providing support to inmates who have mental health issues and are at risk of re-offending. And finally, we have to make sure folks applying for jobs have the tools they need to maintain employment. So we're expanding the Windows to Work program by allowing the program to be in all minimum and medium security prisons and institutions. And that's why we're also announcing tonight that we'll be banning the box statewide. <laughs> We have to reduce employment barriers and empower the folks re-entering our communities with the skills and support they need to live a better life. I know Senator Taylor has been a tireless advocate on this issue, and thank you for your work on this. But fixing our criminal justice system is not the only area of this budget where we can find common ground. Last session, Senator Darling and Majority Leader Steinecke introduced and received unanimous bipartisan support for legislation creating the Interagency Council on Homelessness. The council was chaired by former Lieutenant Governor Clayfish and offered recommendations for addressing homelessness in Wisconsin. 
I know that Republicans recently introduced legislation supporting portions of the Council's ideas. This is critically important work, and that's why just this last week, I announced that I will be chairing the Council myself, and tonight I'm proud to announce that we're accepting each and every one of the Council's recommendations inclu and including them in our budget. Homelessness and housing insecurity affects kids in the classroom, it affects our criminal justice system, and it affects economic development in our communities. We have to connect the dots to get on with this issue, and it's time to get serious about this issue in Wisconsin. Another area we can agree on and where we have to connect the dots is expanding access to broadband. Yes. Yeah. Mary lives in Senator Wirch and Representative Neubauer's district in Racine and came to one of our listening sessions last December. She's seen how businesses and schools are falling behind because of a lack of broadband and thinks this is a hindrance to advancing all industries and technology. Mary told us not to have access and broadband flies in the face of economic development. Mary is here with us in the gallery tonight. Mary, thanks so much for being here. Mary. <laughs> Folks, Mary's right. Lack of access to reliable broadband internet service affects families at homes and affects our classrooms, our hospitals, and building a strong economy. I know there has been bipartisan support on this issue in the past, and we absolutely need to double down on this critically important issue. So we're setting a goal of attaining 25 megabits per second download and 3 megabit per second upload for all Wisconsin homes and businesses by 2025. But we're not just setting goals, we're also going to make sure that we actually have the means to achieve them. That's why we're making historic investments in broadband expansion grants, increasing total funding to more than $78 million over the biennium. That's more than four times what was invested during the last state budget. And we're going to be targeting those grants to the unserved and underserved communities who need them the most. So from broadband to homelessness to criminal justice reform, among many other things in this budget, there's much we can agree upon. I've said all along I'm willing to work across the aisle to get things done. I've said all along that there's more than unites us than divides us. We just have to choose to put people before politics. We have to do what's best for the people of our state. And most importantly, we have an obligation to listen truly listen to what the people of Wisconsin need and what they're asking of us. That starts with health care. I've said all along we need to expand Medicaid in Wisconsin, and according to a recent Marquette Law poll, 62 percent of Wisconsinites agree. 82,000 more Wisconsinites will have access to affordable, quality health care coverage. And because we're accepting these federal dollars, we have the opportunity to invest in programs that improve health care access and affordability across our state.
It means that we can invest in programs to address infant mortality and to encourage preventative care like cancer and STI screenings. It means we're going to put our money with, where our mouths are, literally, to ensure Wisconsin isn't among the worst states in dental care in the country. And it means we can expand access to substance abuse and mental health treatment, intervention and stabilization, especially in our rural communities, for people who are in crisis. So additionally, the people of Wisconsin is, have asked us to fully fund our public schools. More. More than one million Wisconsinites have raised their own property taxes to support their local schools and their communities. This is simply not sustainable. I've said all along that what's best for our kids is best for our state, and investing our kids will yield dividends for our future. That's right. So we're going to start with K-12 education, providing historic investments, and returning to two-thirds funding at the state level. Yeah. In the past decade, we've not only cut public school funding, we've failed to fund programs for our kids with special needs. Aaron is from St. Francis and lives in Senator Larson and <coughs> Representative Sinicki's district. Aaron joined us for our listening sessions in December, and she talked about some of the gaps in our education system and what more support and attentiveness would have helped someone like her when she was growing up. Aaron said, special education is important to me because education, sometimes students need extra support. For some students, a little. For some students, it's a lot. But if we don't have the resources we need to access, everybody loses in the end. Because of folks like Aaron, we're making sure that kids like Mac and Abby have the support and resources they need to be successful. So as I told you during the State of the State address, our budget includes an unprecedented $600 million increase in special education funding. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to squeeze resources to make sure that every kid can be successful. Aaron, Mack, and Abby are here with us tonight in the gallery. Thanks so much for being here, folks. We have to support our kids in the classroom, and we also have to make sure that we're supporting educators who teach our kids, too. Wisconsin pays our public school teachers less than the national average, which makes it harder to recruit.
We announced We announced this week that we're increasing funding for our technical colleges by $18 million over the biennium and investing, investing more than $150 million in our University of Wisconsin system. That means we're able to freeze tuition for undergraduate residents in Wisconsin, but our universities shouldn't have to sacrifice affordable for quality education. So we're not just going to freeze tuition, we're also going to fund that freeze. And no one should have to struggle paying their bills because they pursued higher education. I've said all along that folks should be able to refinance their loans just like any mortgage. That's why I'm also bringing together State Treasurer Godlewski, DFI Secretary Designee Blumenfeld, and a member of the Higher Education Aids Board, along with others, to work on creating a Wisconsin-based strategy for student loan debt refinancing. <laughs> Finally, we're going to make sure that regardless of whether a kid is born in this country, if they went to Wisconsin high school and have lived here for three years, they shouldn't have to pay more tuition like out-of-state students. They should be treated like any other kid from Wisconsin. In addition to funding public schools at every level, I believe everyone should have the opportunity to participate in our democracy. People should be able to choose their elected officials, not the other way around. So, so earlier this week, we announced that we're creating a nonpartisan redistricting commission. And as it turns out, the people of Wisconsin agree. According to a recent Marquette Law poll, 72% of Wisconsinites want nonpartisan redistricting in Wisconsin. Yeah. And that's not just these guys. 63% of the Republicans and 76% of the independents support nonpartisan redistricting. Yeah. I know Senator Hansen has done extensive work on this. Thank you for your leadership. Now, nonpartisan redistricting is, a, is only part of the democratic process and participation. So we're not only including nonpartisan redistricting in our budget, we're also going to direct the Elections Commission and the Department of Transportation to work together on implementing automatic voter registration in Wisconsin. <laughs> And I know Representative Crowley, I know Representative Crowley has been working on this issue, so thank you so much. And finally, we turn to transportation. 
I've said all along that our current approach to transportation is unsustainable. For years, we've kicked the can down the road on this issue, and we can't afford to do it again. According to a 2018 trip report, industries like retail stores, tourism, agriculture, and manufacturing bolster about 1.4 million full-time jobs, and they depend on our roads and our highways and our bridges. About $580 billion in goods are shipped across our state each year. Yet, our roads rank among the worst in the nation. And according to that same report, our infrastructure problems are costing Wisconsin taxpayers $6.8 billion annually in higher vehicle operating costs, accidents, and traffic delays. That's bad for our economy. It's bad for our pocketbooks. It's time to find a long-term solution to our transportation crisis, and that's what I'm proposing to do here tonight. I said when we ran for governor, or when I ran for governor, excuse me, that I'd get everyone to the table and find a solution that works for everyone. And that's what we did. And that's why tonight I'm proposing the largest biennial investment in transportation in Wisconsin state history. But this won't be a one-time fix. We're going to raise more than $600 million in new revenues to fix our roads, bridges, and highways and make sure that our transportation fund is sustainable for our future. Now, I want to be clear, everyone's going to have to give a little to make this work. That's compromise. That's what it's called. We're all going to have to share the burden so that it's feasible for everyone and to make sure that we're not passing the buck on to the next generation. We're going to be increasing fees for titles and heavy trucks, and we do have to raise the gas tax. But as I promised all along, we're sure as heck not going to raise the gas tax by a dollar. It's going to be less. It's going to be less. We're going to raise it eight cents a gallon, well below what they did over the, over the river, raising it by 20 cents in Minnesota and 18 cents in Ohio. But the good news is we're also going to repeal a hidden tax that costs you 14 cents a gallon on gas. That, that, that means our plan actually makes it possible for you to pay less at the pump than you do right now. Because of all this, we're going to make sure that local governments don't have to rely on things like wheel taxes to make ends meet. So we're going to increase general transit and transportation aid to counties and local governments by 10 percent to repair local roads and bridges. Those are the highest levels in Wisconsin history. And we're going to do all this without having to raid our general funds and jeopardizing other budget priorities like expanding broadhand, broadband, like fully funding our public schools and reforming our criminal justice system. Because our long-term solution on this issue, Wisconsin highway bonding in our budget, is the lowest it's been in over 20 years. It's time we pay our bills and stop kicking the can down the road. At the end of the day, the people of Wisconsin expect, expect and deserve for us to get to work on these present, uh, these present issues. From broadband to health care, education to justice reform, roads to redistricting, these are priorities of the people of our state. Their plight must be our purpose, their crises our call, and their desires our demands. You know, I've heard some remark that people of Wisconsin chose divided government this November. I don't think that's the case. 
I think the people of Wisconsin didn't choose us to be divided. They chose us to find it within ourselves to be united, not in party, but in promise to serve our state and to do what's best for the people who sent us here. <laughs> Folks, let's get to work. Thank you so much, and on Wisconsin. Governor Tony Evers concluding his first biennial budget address as he did the State of the State with a rendition of On Wisconsin, but also talking about health care, education, and tax cuts. There will be a lot to discuss and analyze in the weeks ahead. Tonight we're joined by Jason Stein, Research Director at the Wisconsin Policy Forum. Jason, thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here. There's a lot to digest in any budget the first day you get it, both in the speech and, you know, in the backup materials that the governor hands out. What struck you about what you heard from the governor tonight and what you've read so far? Well, obviously, it's a historic day. It's the return of a Democratic governor for the first time in eight years. And today was the governor's day. He proposed some changes that would be historic, but at the same time, many of them are non-starters with the legislature. So we'll have a lot of debate to come. This is just the first step. So what, what are some of the things that are jumping out at you as far as proposals or numbers that maybe we haven't heard already? I mean, the big one we've been waiting for was transportation. We heard about a gas tax. We also know from background briefing that there's going to be some utility or some fee increases. Absolutely. 